All right, so again, let me welcome you to the Share Thinkathon. This is actually a special day for us because this is the marks the last day of the tutorial thinkathons. For those of you who have been part of our thinkathons throughout this whole process, we told you that there was two different types, tutorials and then research thinkathons. And this actually is the end of our tutorial thinkathons. So it's a very uh, happy day because what we've been trying to do is prepare people to actually do the research part of, of cloud computing. And as, and as a special thank you, I just wanna really um, give a shout out to Luca Calazon because without him, many of much of this would not be possible. So um, I just wanna thank my colleague in helping us get to the end of these tutorials and starting the new ones. So today we're doing computational data science strategies. And this is not meant as a course on how to do computations itself, but to provide you a broad overview of all the computational uh, data strategies and what is an algorithm and those kinds of things. So that you kind of have an idea of what you have to do and where you have to go to learn. So this is like um, when we did Python, we did a pre-Python course so that you understood the terminology and, and what strings are and what codes are used for. This is the same idea today because there are so many different um, computational strategies. We wanted to give you both a statistical perspective as well as a cloud computing perspective. And in doing that, we also have a very important guest, um, Ken uh, Wilkins, Dr. Ken Wilkins, and I'll introduce him in a few minutes. And he will lead much of that uh, computational part. And Luca will address the bias mitigation parts of, of computations. Um, I always do a little overview because some of you are brand new to our thinkathons. Um, for those of you who have been with us, in all these months, um, maybe I'll say something new. So hang in. SHARE stands for the Science Collaborative for Health Disparities and Artificial Intelligence Bias Reduction. Of course, anything like this would not be possible without a slew of people helping us get to this place, including not only funders, but um, people who help us think through what we need to do. As we have done in the past, we are going to um, run these Slido polls and it's gonna be very important. We ask all of you, and I'm gonna turn this over to our contractor, Kevin, who's gonna help you do the Slido setup because with the Slido setup, you need to please do this because not only are we gonna ask you questions right now, but during Ken's presentation, there's gonna be some interaction that we're gonna ask you to do as well. So um, Kevin, do you wanna explain Slido, please? Absolutely, hopefully you can see my screen here. Um, and as Dr. Duran mentioned, we'll be using Slido throughout today's webinar to get some feedback from you, the participants. To use Slido, you can either download the Slido app on your phone or simply go to slido.com on either your phone or your computer. Alternatively, you can simply scan the QR code that you see on the screen here on your mobile device. Um, and lastly, uh, I will have my colleague Mark uh, put in the chat uh, the direct link for uh, today's Slido. So um, today, to join today's Slido via slido.com or the app, all you need to do is enter code SHARE, where it prompts you to enter code here at Slido. Um, for those of you who choose to go to slido.com, uh, that will be at the top of the page in the blue box, just like the one you see on the screen here. Um, when we do get time for, uh, you know, for Slido polls, uh, the code will be displayed on the screen. So no need to worry if you haven't gotten there just yet. Um, and you'll have time once we, once we start. But uh, so with that, I will go ahead and uh, launch our first 
uh, poll here. And so if you've gotten yourself to Slido at this point, uh, you will see the uh, poll pop up and you will be able to respond to it. Um, many of these questions we ask um, because it helps us to tailor our presentation to the needs of the people who are, are watching. So please complete. And, you know, every thinkathon, we have some people that are the same, and we also have people that are different. And so, therefore, our experience changes. So, um, please log on to Slido. Come on, you guys, there's hundred people here. Seven shouldn't be responding. Play with us. This is gonna, the Slido piece is, we're taking a little bit of time to get people onto Slido now because it's much more important when Ken starts his presentation. And he's going to go a little bit faster, so we're not going to have time to log everybody on to Slido, so please do it now. Okay, um, Kevin, you want to give us the result stuff for each one? Yes, you should see, yeah, you should see the results here on the screen. Do you see them for the first Python question? For first one, Python, yeah. So this is much better because we're getting some experience with Python and R. That's good. Good. Um, we've got some cloud computing experience. This is much better than we first started. When we first started, everybody was none. Okay, so it looks like we have a few people that are really um, have had some experience with cloud computing and um, and a little bit of interest in health outcomes and health disparities. So this is kind of a shift in our population demographics, which is good. Dr. Doreen, would you like me to now go to the interest? Sure. Question? Okay. We have another question on Slido, if you would please fill it out. Um, basically, we're asking why are you coming to the Thinkathon? And here we're asking you to check all that apply. By the responses, it looks like you've come to the right place because we are um, moving into doing research that leverages big data for health disparities, health outcomes research. And of course, it, it's all kinds of research dealing with health and biomedical. And um, we hope to have lots of collaborations that lead to publications that um, utilize the skills that you're bringing to us today and to enhance those skills. So, uh, Kevin, do you want to close this out? And I'll take it back. Yep, back to you.
Okay, you should see my screen. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you an overview of what Share and Terra is. Terra is, um, I noticed that there was a lot of people on the call today that hadn't been familiar with Terra. And I will suggest that um, towards the end of my portion of the of the presentation, I'm going to give you a link to where the tutorials are. Since Terra is the platform that Share is the interface to Share, I will um, advise that you go to those um, recorded videos and learn how to do Terra. The nice thing about doing Terra on the Share platform, it's the same interface platform at, for other NIH clouds as well, like Anvil, all of us, Biodata Catalyst. And so by learning Terra through here, you can access all those other clouds as well. So for those of you who are new, Share is a cloud-based population science data platform. We have we focus on the social determinants of health data, behavioral data. We really have developed this to increase the participation of women and underrepresented populations in data science. Um, we also hope to shift from the um, use of, of uh, computer laptops, um, analytics to big data and cloud computing in order to get a more comprehensive picture of health outcomes and health disparities research. And the last sort of objective that we have with this is that we hope that we can start to develop better strategies to mitigate um, biases and ethical inquiries in doing cloud computing. Share is composed of uh, data sets. I referred to them earlier of population science, health, de um, social determinants of health, behavioral, environmental data sets. We are, have a, a data repository that's coming soon. We have all kinds of computational abilities capabilities on the web page on Terra, and we're using um, many tools, oftentimes free to use um, on the cloud platform. We use our framework is actually Google with a Terra interface. And of course, then we have a sister GitHub and all of our information is found on the NIMHD web share portal. And I'll give you access to that with this nimhd.nih.gov.share. And that's how you get into the platform and participate in um, thinkathons as well. Share has a data ecosystem. We have um, over 240 uh, public data sets that deal with population health and health disparities, um, behavioral health. It's organized by the social determinants of health of CDC, which is economic stability, education access, healthcare access, neighborhood and built environments, and social and community context. We also have two other categories of health behaviors and disease and conditions. In addition, we're de developing a repository for grants because of data sharing policy at NIH, in which our um, grantees and at, all across NIH can deposit their um, data sharing into our repository, which is really focused more on the social sciences. All the other repositories are more basic science um, driven. As I said, we have over 240 um, data sets. What is important um, about our repository as well is that it is common uh, data elements focused. So these are called CDEs in short. And, and a CDE is a standardized way that a question is asked. 
The reason this is important is because it shares a common semantic language and there are codes that are associated with it. Once you have that semantic, shared semantic language and a, an associated code, you're better able to increase in, enhance data interoperability and foster better data aggregation. So this is a very important um, innovative approach to a repository because we hope that by doing this, um, we're using these um, URIs, the, con the CDE concept codes as a way to um, aggregate the data easier and make it easier for you to put together data sets. These are the share CDEs that have been approved. As you can see, these are NIH endorsed, and we're very proud of these because these are the first institute that has done this. Um, we are working with the National Institute of Nursing, as you saw at the, at the very beginning as well. And so these are the common data elements. The last two, the NIMHD framework and the health disparities outcomes, these are project level, as the rest of them are in individual level. The reason this is important is because if all the, the data is, um, if all the data submitted uses these common data elements, it increases, it increases our ability to link to like American Community Survey with an NIMHD project, for instance, and then we can actually link to another whole platform. So it just increases this interoperability and the, um, and the better enhancement to create um, metadata, which is important in doing um, cloud computing artificial intelligence research because we need large data sets. This core common data element approach is also getting um, mapped to other major federated data sets like American Community Survey and BRFAS. The other part that we have really paid attention to consciously is to have a Terra platform, because as I said, the other clouds use Terra as well, which then enables us to across platforms. So someone could do, for instance, Anvil as the genomic database, cloud um, database. It connect with share database and do epigenetic studies. The new repository that's going to come soon is really focused on the CDEs so that um, we can create this better interoperability. And it also helps us to make sure that we're all measuring the same uh, elements in Terra. So this will be, the repository will be a sister to the Share Terra platform. In the Share Terra platform, we have secure workspaces. I'm going over this briefly because we're not going to really get into Terra today, but I want those of you who've never seen Terra to understand that on this cloud, you can create your own workspace and in this workspace, it's totally secure. And you get to assign the roles. If you want even a whole classroom to come into the platform with you, you can. Or it can just be you and another collaborator or just you by yourself. You get to assign those roles and your workspace is totally just for you. And it's confidential and people cannot see what you're doing in these spaces. The other piece that we've done is that we've created notebooks, and I give a special thank you to um, Luca for these, especially because in each of these notebooks, there are Python and R codes that allow you to just cut and paste and to do analyses that even if you don't know Python in R, because we're really trying to get you started in this, because once I know, once we get you started, you're going to get the fever like the rest of us. 
So in all of these notebooks, there's this cut and paste sort of approach to these workflows. And then um, you can run analysis even if you don't know code. So it's just a matter of changing code and it's obvious on how to do that. Another key feature that we're doing to the cloud, because if some of you may not have, be very active in cloud because you don't know Python on R. And so the other piece that we're doing is that, that we're actually adding a statistical package called SAS. And we hope to have that done by summer of this year. Um, we have lots of users and we would welcome you to register to become one of our users as well. And the, the share platform itself is highlighted by the use of the thinkathons. And these are monthly tutorials that we actually do. And in these tutorials, um, these are the ones that we've already done. We've done the, uh, we, we first did the cloud computing and then we did Terra data sets, Terra hosted data sets, all the Terra teaching you Terra. Then we did a segment teaching you Python. And then we did a segment that we're doing right now, which is the common data elements and an introduction to fair data and the computational data strategies. This allows us to move into the research thinkathons. By this prep, it taught you what data science is, how to use the Terra platform, and then just some basics into what the elements are to actually do AI computing. As I said at the beginning, we are coming to an end to this um, tutorials, which are posted on this um, site. So if you go to the NIMHD Thinkathon, um, you can see all the recordings and the PowerPoints that will review all of this information for you. This will lead us to what we're going to start next, which is actually hands-on research using the cloud. So we welcome you to participate with us in the future to create these research teams. And in the research teams, we hope to have multidiscipline, multi-career level, helping each other out uh, so that there are some data scientists that can help researchers that have never done Python, but they know the content and the expertise in health disparities research, and they'll teach you and you'll teach them. So we hope that this works out so that all of us can upskill and create publications using um, big data. So I'm going to um, turn this back over to Kevin for the interest poll. And then, well, let me introduce um, Ken first. Um, Ken is our guest speaker today, uh, because after we do the poll, Ken will take over the screen. Um, Ken is a former math and computer science high school teacher. He and I share that. I used to be a high school teacher as well. Um, he's worked over two decades in biomedical research. He is at NIDDK, and he and I actually work on several work groups together because we do common data elements and, and social determinants of health and many other things. So he is a an esteemed, respected colleague. So I'll introduce um, Ken. We'll turn it over to the Kevin to do the poll, and then Ken will take over the screen after the poll. Yeah, Dr. Duran, we actually already uh, took care of that poll. So oh, we'll we go did right that to Ken. Okay. Yep. Well, then we'll go right to Ken. So Ken, I'm going to stop share and it's all yours. Ken, it looks like you're, you're uh, muted on some level. I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, that'd be because I'm double muted. <laughs> had my phone in there. So, um, and, no, it's great to be able to join you, Deb and Luca and Ken uh, here and, and this whole can community and share. Can you're echoing. Can you hear me well? No, you're echoing. I'm echoing. 
So you may need to turn one of those off. Now we can't hear you. You turned the wrong one off. <laughs> Looks like your Zoom is muted, Ken. Oh, oh, there, you there you okay, go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Oh, uh, let me just add one thing, please, Ken, before you start. Um, you know, we have many, as you saw in the poll, we have many different levels of knowledge and experience and understanding of what Ken is about to do. We've really tried to put a little bit in here for both novice people who've never done this, as well as more experienced people. You know, Ken and I are both high school teachers, so we know this. However, what if you get totally lost or you need, um, if you have any specific questions, please put them in the chat. And as much as possible, uh, Luca and I will will um, answer as much as we can. And if it, if Ken's going too fast, we'll slow him down. We all, we've rehearsed all of this. So feel free to use the chat. Um, no question is stupid. So use the chat as much as you can. And Luke and I will try to, try to st stay up with Ken. Okay, Ken, thank you. Uh-oh, you're muted again. Um, now, how about now, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, excellent. All right, double muting again, and you can see the full screen. Yes. Uh, no, we well, yeah, we don't see it in presentation. Oh, though, the slide. Slide. There you how's, go. How's that? Okay, there we go. All right, finally, we'll get around to you know, it's only AI preparing for AI too. You can't get your um, Zoom session to work too well. You want to you know take a deep breath and. Maybe and I'm sorry time. to. So, and I'm sorry to jump in for you, but but your your audio sounds yeah. a little bit like you're you're underwater. I don't know if you have a different method of connection that you can use. Um, it's just yeah, a little, I little do. difficult to hear. Let's try this. I was through the phone and my earbuds. Let's try this. How about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, much, much better. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's that's great. Thank you. All right, third time's a charm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's perfect. That's that. That's much better. Um, if you could make sure to speak up, that would be great. But but we can hear you much better than before. Thank you. Much better. Okay, I'll sure be sure to speak up, and then you'll be able to hear me. Um, one last chance back to be able to hear you. I might say something. I just put my earbuds in between. We're all good as long as you make sure to speak up. Okay, I will speak up. I'll use my teacher voice then. <laughs> it's been some years and I'll probably be quite tired by the end of it, but I think we're all going to be tired because this is going to be a big whistle stop tour around a lot of destinations. But don't worry, it's kind of like you've got a limited time to join and visit some sort of unfamiliar part of the country or maybe even another country. What do you do? Get out your maps. If you have someone who's your local guide, they take you through places, but you want to check a lot of things off your list that you may do today. It's going to be a whistle stop tour of the usual frame analogy. Um, so, just, just an outline of how we'll go through things for an overarching look at the landscape. Cover traditional statistics and epidemiologic methods as a baseline, and then get into artificial intelligence as a broad new horizon of which a special subset is machine learning, which has been sort of bridge building back to these traditional methods, even more modern versions of those methods that are going to be, it's all on the table as far as what you want to be able to use. Now, Deb, you turned your camera on. It makes me think I'm not clear auditorially. <laughs> Doing good? Dr. Duran, you're on mute as well. 
No, you're, you're good. I was having some visual problems myself. Looks like you muted yourself, Ken. With those things in mind, <laughs> I will uh, continue on and start our little stop tour and work our way through how we might get a sense. But again, it's a very public landscape and maybe your hopes in having some sort of one-stop shop for all of the things you might use and what would be useful for what, in what situations will be there. But we'll try to have you have some guidance and some things for it. And we might also try to instill maybe some resources within the shared community that people can come back to that will be, we'll share things and learn as we go amongst our various teams. So first getting an understanding of the landscape, um, where it's, it'll seem like a whirlwind today, but I do want to be more of a whistle stop. We'll pause at some certain key places, grasp some certain key concepts, not all of them, but we'll have a lot of jargon we throw at you. And that's where I want to say, like, as we go through our preliminaries and we get our reminder of the context of health disparities, important um, goal of study within the share, we're going to have to make sure we keep track of these jargon terms like we do right here with, um, like, this alarm clock in the lower left. That's going to be a way to trigger that we have a jargon and we can kind of slow down, make sure that at least a glancing familiarity of what that term is referring to is shared amongst all of us. Um, and if not, don't worry, we're going to be have a chance to be about the recording. You'll have these slides, or even have a transcript perhaps. And then I'm also going to offer offer office hours tomorrow for an hour and a half. That's probably in the middle of most people's day or early in the day for the West Coast um specific so maybe there'll be a chance to follow up and get things clarified if you're not clear on something and then things you still won't be clear on is this decision making framework it's an early teaser because data science grows so rapidly with such um very branches of innovation on this whole you know, thriving tree of human endeavor it's very hard to decide which tools be put in this decision making framework, but we'll give you some flavors for things, which branches go along, and we'll only do so and decide that after we few things in the toolbox. So to move on, um, we are my invitation drawings there. Um, now, what we want to do in the end is come out as a data science practitioner. You want to be practical with what you use. It's really a term in data science coined by a statistician, and it's been adopted by computer science, informatics, and a number of other interdisciplinary things. But that's a key thing. It's an interdisciplinary. It's got a, it's metadisciplinary to the extreme fact. It's a way of looking at data in new ways, and probably at scales we're not even familiar with, which is why cloud computing is such part part of the shape. But really, being practical also means you got to get things done. And you want to do it, you get the most effective tools for the task at hand. And it may be the most effective tool that you have at hand, as I'll point out later. So I do a lot of open source things like Python, and maybe other things that are open source like R, Join, or Scan, but and maybe commercial things like SAS that will eventually have a platform that can be also be effective, but they may not be readily at hand for everybody. So just try to emphasize it that way. And we'll try to have a range of methods from traditional even more modern statistics that you probably can be exposed to if you've had prior statistics training or classwork and epidemiologic methods for those that are not promoted with epidemiology. And where some of those don't meet the needs, we turn to AI and machine learning where there's so much happening now and you see that so many parts of various industries and sectors of uh, the public private realm are, are turning to. So we want to get a working definition of what those are, but we want to bear in mind Health disparities in the context, the primal aim of share playing history. You know, all know the aim as it's written down here. How do we do that? Well, it's by bringing everyone along this whistle top stop tour and try to pause at key locations, get to know key phrases. Imagine being visiting somewhere where you, you might have to know a little bit more of a dialect or lingo and make sure it's brought along with us. Now, 
one other thing about being a science practitioner is that you'd be a scientist in what you do. You're trying to, it's a practice of adding to generalizable knowledge. So as scientists, we need to be aware of our blind spots. Those are the tacit assumptions. We may be very compelled to do what some other group has done in a certain realm, but we also want to be aware of how they might have had their own blind spots and what they assumed or didn't assume or wasn't even aware that they were assuming just with what they, did, they had to have at hand. And so checking the subject is a big part of that. And that's the design behind the data that harkens back to the research design about prior thing about it in November. Um, as we work some covers on these working definitions above, let's really look at um, these aims of share. Um, it's increased participation of the very group that's on the call now, women underrepresented populations with health disparities in data science through data science with training, cross discipline mentoring wide. You've got people from various backgrounds, like those of us hosting the meeting, as well as our, around the table, and multiple career levels, just like was hinted at by Deb in terms of future research projects that are going to be team science related. It leverage the population science, the social determinants of health, and behavioral big data and cloud community tools to foster paradigm shift and disparity. And then ultimately in health and healthcare through the outcomes research in, in, in those states that health care delivered. Um, but with that in mind, let's look at a lay of the land of data science. What's lay of the land mean? Well, I've got a definition here from Marilyn Webster. It's often used figuratively, but really it goes along with our landscape tour, our whistle stop tour, someplace. If health disparities is our issue, we have this dual problem from the primal aim of is mitigating extant biases. And Luke will get into a lot of really compelling examples of that later on in this talk, uh, later on in our session, I think about it. But what does it mean to have absolutely be biased? And mitigate it means something different to all parties. It's not necessarily um, the same thing to each person. There's different biases and perspectives and experience. So we might see a confirmation bias. You know, who, what question you choose, even if you subject to your own subjective biases. But there might be, even if you wanted to answer certain questions, there's maybe a lot of limited data that's available, and that can induce selection bias, et cetera. These are terms that have been tossed around on a lot of like um, other data science adjacent fields like that and statistics and research design, but um, they will differ from something that like is used in mathematical statistics, like this theoretical behavior of a data method that's supposed to go in the long run as you get more and more independent units of information closer and closer to what you're targeting. If it doesn't, there's statistical bias. And that just falls from any one being derived from data being a statistic. Not all of them have the properties we would like them to, as we'll learn a little bit later. Well, hints at a little bit later. Some, some of the theory is not as well developed as it might be, especially with some of our large uh, deep learning architectures. It's to large language models, but there is some encouraging developments. So we really want to think about these things and not just be too enamored with uh, the methods that we use. As a self-taught statistician who was once a chemist, George Bach said, he said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Be humble about what you're going to use as a data method and the model involved, the assumptions involved, and the data you may have at hand and the inherent assumptions in that. There may be inherent balances and that can lead to algorithmic bias. So key distinction here by Chen Charlovitz and the same in the American Medical Association's Journal of Ethics is that in contrast to human bias, algorithmic bias occurs when an AI model trained on a given data set. Again, what do you take as a given in your data produces results that may be completely unattended by the model creators? We'll have a lot of counterexamples like that. So, as we get our lay of the land of these health disparities, it could very much arise, inadvertently arise, not intended, but still come out of an AI process or any other data method process. You should be aware of it. Take agency. Try to better characterize these sources of bias. And in some ways, that's where a lot of the social determinants of health um, and other sort of context specific societal, um, environmental proxy measures, even if they're sort of an aggregate measure that's not particular to one person, but maybe could be linked in, those supplements are key. And we'll see an example of that in a later AI application. So it's just 
be aware of that and thanks to all the things that have already been baked into the share platform and you'll be able to take advantage of some may be there and be careful to really match it up to the other data you're working with others will be missing but you want to recognize they're missing and what you can also do is just put in for some people that's incomplete for you put in indicators of that and there's waiting for missing features that under certain assumptions can recover what you would like to have as relationships but Today, it's just about concepts. We're not gonna, we're gonna think about what it means to wait as opposed to actually trying to implement the weights. It's better to get things grasped fully conceptually prior to coding. And then you can reinforce those concepts with experiential learning as it's usually looked at under this link and get the slides for adult learners like yourselves, all of us around the table here. Now, some of us as adult learners had to be dragged through part of a stats course at some point. But there's a long history of people trying to work with these patterns in nature, the mathematical aspects of it, and making sense of phenomena observed like data would be. And that go, goes back all the way to the, you know, the Hypatia of Alexandria, um, uh, you know, working out some of the things and then, then being actually um, cross persecuted for, the, for a reason for that. Um, and it threw to more things that are much more recent and then there the past century, like David Blackwell work, we have a lot of key mathematical statistical theories. So we're gonna try and have a quick retrospective of early early ways of getting around and then the theme of Robust Soft Toward, look at early locomotives through like the diesel revolution up to the current, you know, electro electric um, and electronically powered uh, trains like the bullet train. So I'll have to admit here that I stand before you as someone who's gone to grad school for biostats, never having heard that term before, um, even getting to my first job, which was a high school math teacher at computer science. And they were always asking me, this was a night school, 17 different school districts um, in Virginia and uh, from urban to rural. And where is this ever useful? I just had more math classes than them. And I certainly didn't find appeal in what I call my stats class, which was sort of an area of coverage within the undergrad picture. But it always seemed like a laundry list of recipes. But the key thing is that it, it kind of came very dry. It's not like being on a cooking show, right? Where you see interacting with other people and getting all the ingredients together and you're doing things and maybe going a little bit from the hip and reacting to what happens in the in the process of putting these together. It's just it's a very dry text written recipe thing. Hopefully, more recently, there's less of that. We want to be more like some of the people that just happen in statistics, like John Tukey, guy yeah, in terms like bit and software, and um, and and exploratory data analysis for another. But be like data scientists, like he do statisticians. You get to play in everybody's backyard, but play is a important thing. Play is fun. You discover things, you're learning new things, and you're applying them as you go. And you're doing it in the context of others that you, you yourself learn from as they learn from you. So um, again, hopefully that's going to set the right tone to this communication with food science. But I already see you right here. Like if you, if somehow you, um, you can always use modern statistical methods. If if not AI or ML and even artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Um, to, to do your, your actual tasks at hand, like a good prediction model. And we'll see one example in chronic kidney disease that where we, we collaborated in my institute with the you know, also National Coordinator for Health at IT and, uh, and looked at predicting mortality within the, uh, the key. Um, there was one population covered by Medicare, population covered by Medicare without disability outside of those over 65 and stage three. And we looked at things. To some of those are will outperform regular fancy deep learning. So you got tabular structured health data. And so they used a model, a method that was much more tied to stats than one might say to AI and ML. But you might want to use a whole hybrid of these when it comes to multimodal data types that involve both, you know, time series, repeated measures over time, or um, images plus sort of tabular numeric and text data. We probably combine these together. So multimodal, that's our 
first ding 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 we've got jargon term but um if the information is tied together and you want to take advantage of all of it it's probably means when you and you see this in some of our later examples when you actually add, look what packages of software to use blending a lot of those methods together so you shouldn't see it as you, you should see this all as parts of one big toolbox for yourself the, the statistical statistics onward and really it all goes down to like we we are going to make arrow when oops pardon me when there's so much more data storage compute and quick ways to work data in and out and do so iteratively and that comes down to the, the fact that algorithms are more than just this close from formula you do in the back of an envelope or even an iterative one that could be done on a machine that probably had less compute than my uh, apple watch here we it's algorithms and there's various kinds for the passage here that's nice and selected by Deborah um, that helps us, you know, uncover patterns. Or if we have a certain predefined task where we kind of know the pattern we want to predict, we can leverage those to get the most efficient conclusion, better than anyone could, even the human. And that's kind of why we get to say machines learning, um, like humans learn, and then reaching levels that we call it artificial intelligence. So, but the key thing is that. This, it all comes down to a machine. If this machine's going to do it. It's got to be reduced to those algorithms that people can get their head around and really write out the map if they had to, or at least the, the process by which it may iterate over the data. And those data need to be quickly turned into ones and zeros back and, and, and get back things, even if it's something like text. Um, so a lot of that under the hood part we can take for granted in some ways, but we want to make sure that we realize that that's sort of, besides data being the lifeblood, the algorithms provide that vasculature of delivering the blood where it needs to go. So that each part of this body of, of data discovery can be functioning properly. Okay, that said, let's step back. Back to things where you can just write it out in the back of an envelope. Probably did this from grade school through middle school to high school and at some point in, in any training you've had after that, you had the, the median or mean, an easy rule of thumb, you need traditional stats and having methods, if you can count it on one hand or even two, these will be enough, they will suffice. And you can always accompany like certain point estimates like a mean with quantities of command certainty. Like how much does it deviate around the mean by a variance or standard deviations? We'll see the next step. A lot of these were done by hand or do as you do and share by one line of code. But they'll be important because these are the things when you get to presenting to decision makers that they want to be able to get their hands around and their head around at some point and readily digest. Now, if you're not sure you're, you need to go beyond those simple things, you might at least want to be able to get something that's akin to that simple single figure. Um, but if you have to count on more hands, you might want to go into more modern stats and heavy methods, high dimensional regression, classification, algorithms, some under, un, unsupervised learning things like we'll talk about in some, some uh, algorithms that pass by there later. And some of those have effectively bled into AI and ML. I can remember early in grad school in a computational biology course presenting on multi-layer perceptrons, which the very building blocks that eventually became these deep learning architectures now. So I think to always be aware that there are such commonalities across them makes you open to the right part of the toolbox that work for you. Now, when it comes to epidemiologists, they love to just tabulate and get some quick summaries. Like here, it's a by two table from the case control study of lung cancer and smoking. You have, you know, a number of, of individuals with lung cancer, the cases, the controls, and then you have your smokers and non-smokers as the exposure. In a two by two table, that means two rows, two columns. How do you measure the association between these two things? A natural thing is the odds, but it turns out that's also a natural thing for quantifying disparities, odds and odds ratios. And we see here, as we probably can recall from many years of surgeon general warnings, let alone public health um, uh, 
public health service announcements, et cetera, et cetera, is that, you know, it leads to a, you know, does the odds of exposure among cases, 1.7, while the odds of exposure among control is less than 0 0.2, that means their odds ratio is 8.2. You're, that's something on the odd of saying, you're eight times more likely to have lung cancer, your smoker, than not. And this is where, in terms of disparities, if somehow someone's more likely to have a poor outcome or less likely to have a good outcome, of odds ratio less than one. Again, ratios, one thing in ratio to another, if it's about one, that means they're about the same. Then it's a cause conference concern. Now, this is only association, but we know a lot of studies, and it's even been borne out by a statistician. You might have heard of Fisher's exact test having to do with two by two tables. He loved the smoke. He had a whole argument with other statisticians about it, but then um, that the a thought experiment of you know how they adjusted for a number of other things outside this two by two table with more modern regression methods, and still the odds ratio was very high. So they had to say maybe there's some latent thing that could be there that would really predict lung cancer, whether or not you smoked. How strong would it have to be? Well, it's twice this. And Jerry Cornfield, statistician at NIH, came up with that counter argument. And that's why we have Surgeon General statements now saying that, you know, smoking may cause lung cancer and it's on the black box and we should make materials. So, but it will come in handy as a measure of, of disparities too. Because when we look to, if you don't have a disparity, your odds ratio of these adverse outcomes should be closer to one. And we will look at equalized odds. Plus, I have to mean an odds ratio of them. Now, that's just those. We have um, you know, continuous measures, too. And you should also be familiar with things like mean, median, and quartile range. So things that are roughly even modal and symmetric, mean standard deviation is going to work great. It's very skewed. The mean might get pulled up toward very extreme high or low values. So you want something like the median. That's the bust to that. It's always around 50% of all the values. And the interquartile range gives you that middle 50% around it, which what I've been hearing a lot about middle 50% ever since my daughter started doing the college application process. Um, but there's other things like co-variation. Like look how co-variation happens um, in just these figures here to the right. HbA1c, jargon mark, ding, 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 in two of our major institute studies about type 1 diabetes, that means control clinical trial and edict, which followed up afterward, is in intensive control of blood sugar led to much lower blood sugars, as you see in red. So the conventional stayed high. Very stark differences in this early period. And then when they able to look at these findings and say, let's get everyone on this intensive thing, they did some training and they brought the groups together. Now, maybe not everyone obviously stayed as adherent, in the, in the intensive group early on, but they all got some levels that were um, comparable in the end. And it would take modern methods like in longitudinal data analysis to actually eat these out and do these tests in a way that we can feel confident about the findings. That if they were repeated hypothetically, these trials would get the same example. Sometimes, you don't just look at varies between groups, but over time you look at how two different things co vary, like if there's this correlation coefficient. So um, it gets us to our, our next slide here. And this is an easy pitfall when you have one simple number summary. You have a tendency to want to draw it. It's just from that one number. You need to know it's like I said, decision makers want to get their head around one number that you grasp and kind of hold in mind. Um, there's this is drawn this is without considering the influence of variables not included in that one simple summary measure. In mind of this chart at the right, which is in the New England Journal of Medicine, the correlation between countries per annual per capita chocolate consumption and the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million population. Who's way out there? Switzerland. And then you have other, a lot of Scandinavian countries, which got a lot of discussion as, uh, you know, 
other, you know, is it something about those countries that the, that the authors in this area article were talking about? Um, they, there were a lot of other things that were just like socioeconomic advantage that they didn't, that they only sort of glanced and touched upon. Um, so to really, you know, attribute this trend to something about, you know, chocolate consumption causing that, or maybe something about maybe Nobel laureates need just to, are excited about having good, you know, antioxidant flavanols or whatever their chocolate to, to you know, associate their all their thinking time. You know, it's just a correlation. It's not a causation. We all bear that in mind. And we there's a lost chance this group had if they could get to the data of adjusting for the things. I've done many, many bivariate analyses for both intramural bench scientists, basic scientists, through to epidemiologic observer folks where they say, oh, look, it's exciting correlation. But once you start bringing in other variables, that attenuated because the variability in either one of the measures is going to be explained by the other things. So that's one key pitfall if you're going to rely upon a single message. And yes, ecological fallacy is a great one too. Thank you for you. Um, for you know, what you name there. Um, so one thing I guess uh, I should probably say is that um, that's the beauty of having more um, more modern methods that can look at various things simultaneously, but also do it in a way that lets the data drive what's important to adjust under the constraints that a domain expert may guide you as a fellow data scientist. And these are all things that you would then implement with some underlying algorithms. And I suppose that they report out to be 14 popular AI algorithms and their uses. So we just talked about if, you, if we could have got some linear regression to explain what the variability in um, one of those two variables, it would probably explain away a lot of things. And in some cases, if you're doing a more complicated model where there might be multiple minimum and maximum, something like gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent would help you get there. When you have things that are not on this sort of, um, your estimating parameters are sort of not in continuous scale, you might need to look at something that puts um, a discretized outcome, like a yes, no answer, a zero, one, or a probability of getting a one, that would be logistic regression, which is the maximum likelihood. And just like we wanted to be able to see, okay, how do we separate out groups that kind of fall together? It's easy to draw a line as you might have done in kindergarten, but sometimes the dimension are available data come in, it's not quite right. So you look at support vector machines and the kernel trick to find a project that to a higher dimension where there might be a, a nice way to slide in some dividing group of, of uh, dis discriminating um, uh, delineation amongst latent groups. Very helpful for that. Um, and if you could have, have soft penalty because sometimes groups are going to overlap. It's never bad. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and other some key things that are going to come up later is decision trees with that you can ensembleize them, like have a whole panel of them that randomly vote for things. And sometimes you have to just have a series of these trees that learn from those that went before them, like what variations are explained, and that would get into extreme gradient boosting of these trees. That's going to be seen in an application, the KBCs that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes you would just want to discover these clusters, like I said, as KBCs clustering. And then a key thing that's been around, as Carl Pearson says down here, 1901, analysis, that's a way to look at mutually independent factors that are like latent constructs underlying a set of multiple variables at once. We'll come back to some of these um, as we move along. Oops, I said you better still have this random square. Okay, so let me um, move down to a check on understanding. With simple number summaries and classical statistics, this is where I'll stop sharing and we'll have Devin bring up a couple of questions. We probably not go through all these questions here, but the first two. In the Slido. So, yeah. Kevin, you want to bring up Slido and can yeah. we'll look at the time? Yeah. 
All right, so here's a, a plot. Divorce rate in Maine from 2000 to 2008, it's going down, maybe levels out a little bit, but keeps going down along the same time as the divorce rate. Everyone vote. Do you think these two quantities go together? You might have my explanations and some of the some of the options, but not. Go ahead and vote. Let's see what you think. Is it possible that mar margarine went down as few people in Maine became divorced? Or did they decide to butter their lobster with real butter instead of margarine? More married couples decided to stay together and not get divorced. Or is there some common cause behind each of these per capita margin consumption and the divorce rate being decreased throughout the years? Kind of like we talked about socioeconomic advantage for big chocolate consumption and no low rates. Or maybe they're just two spurious quantities, spurious correlated quantities. Or none of the above. Let's see what you think. I think we got at least 10 people. It should make for some round bits. Anyone else? All right, now people are voting. And yes, I would like to see this. This is kind of a, a gimme, right? Almost where, yes, it can't be that one of those other things is possible. What do you feel safe including? Probably that they're just spuriously correlated with one another. So um, the next one that we can go to it. What can we conclude if we're looking at four corner states, all four states have the same relationship between social vulnerability index and a county level mean long-term measure of blood sugar a costly hemoglobin. We find that correlation is exactly the same amongst all four samples. There's again, a group of 11 counties from one four corner state, and then you go around the four corners and you get all of them. Can you, what can you conclude? They all have the same relationship between the social vulnerability index and long-term blood sugar, despite all the differences of other states, or just they have the same correlation or the same correlation measure, maybe we should use other measures to explore the relationships further. Or maybe you're just not sure. Is it enough to have this one simple summary to make a conclusion about the relationship between two continuous variables, like a social vulnerability index and long-term blood sugar across these settings? And I'm getting more answers now, so this is good. And we see it start to change and up. Oh, um, yes. Ken, Ken mm -hmm. I want you to look at the time. It's 308. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, this these two are enough. I think we got the idea though that we need to delve deeper in the single summary. And you should not always be when you see a correlation, not think it's immediately something that's holding fast and true. It could be latent factors that deal with that. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Take this room back. And um, basically, how do you get things more complex in stats and other? You know, if you need a lot more hands on which to count the quantities involved, whether it's you and a, a few friends, a whole crowd of people, or you need a millipede's amount of hands, you're going to need more parameters and data features. And that's where we get into AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. A lot of them will have millions to billions of these. They'll need a lot of data to try and estimate and reweight anything that reflects the, the, the underlying data accurately, but they've done it. That's why you've seen huge estimates about that. And this is, goes into like just going beyond correlation. So fitting least squares regression, there's again the ding ding for our term, least squares regression. Um, and a lot of modern statistics and happy methods are just like AI, they're kind of prone to what's called overfitting. In other words, being a little too close to the data that's right in front of you and not able to generalize. So the training area is what looks in your set, how different your estimate is, like a straight line here to the left, versus something almost interpolates between points. The best thing would be a good fit in between. And the generalization area is what happens with your best guess estimate by doing random dropout sets, uh, subsets, to say, how would it work in some other sample? One good thing about Learning going from our traditional stats and epi to artificial intelligence and machine learning is this new sort of theory behind why neural networks do so well that they get beyond this interpolation threshold to where it's completely over parameterized, but it has a lot more model capacity for all these nuances. 
as it's seen in a lot of these large language models. So we need a lot more hands try and investigate these other ones and can kind of look at you know a lot of the uh, classification and regression tasks that are happening in this plot effectively using those modern methods. If you need to go even beyond that, that's when AI and that will help. Um, so let's just check one thing. I think we'll maybe we'll skip the overfitting and in the interest of time and move on to what AI and ML and then we can come back to things. But the key thing in stats and every methods where they really shine, things are interpretable. And they tend to be robust if, as you have a transparent way of expressing the inherent assumptions. It's well established too. So it may pass muster more easily in a you know, a scientific corner of the realm that may have never heard of things like um, some of the AI and ML methods that are out there. There may be limited power though, and maybe, you know, maybe over focused on the office testing as some epidemiologists have nicely put it. But a key take home today is how stats and epidemic methods have this interpretability. That's different than explainability, trying to look at it post hoc. Like, you know, if you have a what's called a black box machine, you know, to say that, you know, there's a whole editorial and internally American medical association that black boxes are unacceptable when you have a high status clinical decision. Um, uh, it's, you need some transparency. And if you're a human who's going to have the actual consequences decision on you and someone you you know or love, and you patient, you want it to be as interpretable as possible. Explainability is sort of a last ditch resort. And that's why someone like in the you know, top 60 of, of uh, leaders of AI, and we got Cynthia Irwin here, who's done some work with, with her lab on, on this and has a whole, the JAMA article is, is named right here. And it shows this picture of a husky, could be a husky or could be a transverse flute. They weren't sure. It just, all it can do is show you where this neural architecture is looking to make its distinctions, but it's not gonna be artificial intelligence level of taking place for you. So wherever possible, it's different interpretability. And there's a lot of survey examples and counter examples in here. So um, maybe that's one more, Question: If you could skip Kevin to uh, actually, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. So let's keep some 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 tempo going here. Um, this is a quick rundown of one that's recently been in the news with my institute's uh, focus on kidney disease. Is that the race adjustment, as you have seen in the far right, um, along with sex adjustment, along with age and other things and basing your estimated kidney function off of CO2 added. Really, a big change could happen if a lot of our healthcare system would start adopting a better measure, and that would be through a measure called cystatin C, which it just, it's just not out there and not scaled the same way um, within our, throughout our healthcare system. It's usually only involved in research, but all of us, if we want to help address this disparity beyond addressing this, this epidemiologic um, estimating GFR equation, as we will talk to it later, is trying to make sure, you know, wherever po possible, that C is used. And there are other uh, kind of examples, kind of examples to look at in the But really, health disparity and trying to deal with bias and fairness, whether it's any data method, and getting all the way from trad stats to artificial intelligence to machine learning, it's just a tip of the iceberg. And I would recommend people looking into this uh, article here that I was pointing out to me by some of the um, And in doing so, you'll have this sense of, okay, again, it's a sense of, it could be daunting or overwhelming, but you have agency here. Any data science computational strategy only holds up if it's a three-legged stool. You've got a well-posed use case, curate your data sources, and you have well-matched methods. Why a three-legged stool? Because two legged, only two won't stay up. It'll be like this one in the picture. And the data scientists, you can be the third one. And you, why is it, why are you the third one? You're going to pick those well matched methods. And this quick was a software review, a starting point for it. I mean, some wells use cases are so well posed and the data is so curated for its use, it might function like this two legged stool I show, but not all, most of them. And so I've got some examples and counter examples to do a quick tour of things in this realm. 
Now, without being concerned about jargon just yet, remember the odds we looked at for between smoking and lung cancer. One measure is equalized odds, which also gets talked a lot at the same time as equal opportunity and demographic parity. You can express these in terms of these directed asynchronous graphs, in terms of your sensitive variable that determines your group, your outcome, and then the classification or score that sort of tells you about your risk of that outcome. Um, we're not going to get into what those are, but this is a lot of what you're going to be covering as you get to learn more and more about how to mitigate bias in AI. So what are these fairness measures and what do they each mean? Is it necessarily a lack of bias? Not quite. The problem is that it's not necessarily unique to have this. There's this fairness measures. Some of them, there's a theorem that says, if you satisfy one, you're going to mitigate, not mitigate the other. You're going to potentially exacerbate the other. So what do we have to do? We have to understand better what our use case is and which is the most highest priority fairness measure to do that. Um, and then there's all these other forms of risk of bias, which goes back to our uh, research design. So statistical bias, we talked about as an earlier thing. Confirmation bias, that means a tendency to, to focus on findings that already align with your prior thoughts. That gets into like things like the bias we can talk about globally, gender bias, language bias, political bias. So um, it's most often this idea of what's tacit in our assumptions and how did the data come to us? And so again, and then through the whole problem selection, data collection, outcome definitions, post deployment considerations, post deployment being like if you're actually doing something that can this can the clinical decision support system, that's going to be out there used by others and want it to behave as you intend it to behave. Not that I'm going to bias it really like earlier. And a sister um, community growing up within NIH uh, with Aim Ahead has already had some uh, publications that helped put a framework around this that I point out to you here so we can all be aware okay. of um, One of these key fairness measures that we'll get into in some depth is equalized odds. It's mentioned above, using a lot of papers. There's an original paper out here, but let's look at this thing at the right. It's this two by two table, two rows, two columns. You have your actual, what's truly there, and then you have your predicted. And if we add some color coding here, you'll see that, please forgive the prediction being spelled there in my bar on the slide. There's a true positive rate. How, you know, out of this bottom row of ones, actual ones, how many are true positive? Blue over the blue plus orange. And then you have your false positive rate. How many false positives? Green, sorry, red over the red plus green. Those are two things that, if there's no association with and between actual prediction, if they pretty much match closely, those should be somewhat similar. And just the way odds work out, it's also playing off of the false negative rate. And there's more, if you're not familiar with confusion matrices like this two way two table, right? Or the measure of an odds, you can follow it up in the, the links that are down here and some of the blog posts. But this example of saying a loan repaid or not repaid, is it a, there's there a quality of odds across males and females, men and women, excuse me. Here you can see out of the six total, one third is false positives. I said one of these three empty circles. Well, the false negative rate is only one out of the four filled circles. That happens to be the same false negative rate as for the women. So they actually have equality of odds, even if their rating thresholds, as you're seeing here, or seem quite different. In other words, maybe, you know, that they have, because so many women are better rated than men, maybe they have to have a higher threshold for women if they're trying to go for that as a measure group fairness. So that's one example there, and it relates back to these quantities we talked about in prior slide. But there, this, if you try to meet this, remember, it's not going to be, it may be at the cost of another fairness measure. So that's where we'll come to uh, uh, Slido, if we can, Kevin. And check our thinking there. And all fairness measures be satisfied, i.e., show lack of disparity at the same time in a single application of an algorithm to a single set of data. True or false? You can show the results, Kevin. 
Great. You have a good sense. And yes, it is. Can they all be satisfied? No, false. That's a key take home today. Thanks, Kevin. Would you like to move to the next question or are you going to take it back over? Uh, show me the next one. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I select the best use case for e easy equalized mods as a fairness measure. Remember how we had this confusion matrix. And we were, even with something like a rating or a loan, there was a threshold cut off. Could it be linearly squares regression, classification tasks, or binary label? The correlation between disparity measures across the subgroups, like we had with our four corners example. Fitch have a multi class label. Is it A and C, the first, the third? Or is it B and D? I thought, obviously, I thought that there'd be letters here, but sorry about that. Or is it all of the above? To see where we are after a few more seconds. And this is very instructive to me. I'm going to kind of like phrase my. Kind of It's, my, it's it's actually the best use cases are limited somewhat. What we wanted to look at was whether or not um, whether or not kind of something that can be set into a couple categories. So it actually. It could be all of the above if you were looking at how do I reconcile these two? And I'm going to think maybe that between um, those people that were selecting this and all of the above, you were probably thinking of all of those. Oh, did I do something wrong? I'm meeting everybody. So that we need we need just to clarify, it would be something that could be in one class or another, a multi-class label, a binary label, and that also means, again, sorry that there weren't letters to go along with each of these, B and D, the second and fourth option. Um, so well, I appreciate you getting that, that on there. That, now, I, that shows that we need to sort of be aware that and a quick dive into a one fairness measure there's more to be learned about these various measures, but at least we have a, a knowing, um, glancing uh, uh, introduction to what this is and we, what we need to learn more about. It's going to be very important to make bias. But the key thing everyone got is that you cannot satisfy all of them at once, and it may vary which variables you're measuring, measuring and working with. Okay, getting back to the slides, let's look at artificial intelligence. In data science, it's a broad new horizon. We hear about generative AI now. Ding, ding, ding. I put that in a certain thing. Deep learning where, you know, they can generate phenomena that we can see and appreciate as humans, like art, deep face, et cetera. And sort of a mix of unsupervised, supervised learning, which we'll clarify later as a text. But we need to have an idea that's common to everybody here. We want to say it's the power of a machine to copy intelligent human behavior. And there's a specific subset, machine learning. As you're saying, generative AI mentions deep learning. It's a special form of deep learning within this, these nested subsets here that uses both supervised and unsupervised learning. It's, we'll get into what that distinction is, but it's learning. It's the computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed by humans. In some cases nowadays, in fact, the generative AI will generate the programs off of a prompt that you give it with the chat GPT. So um, as much as this is happening here, I want to have a quote I selected from the AMAB leader presented to my advisory council, so my panel writes to get away. Say not I have found D truths, but rather I have found A truths. Let me support real LeBron. So we should always be humble even with our findings and be a little bit skeptical even with all the whiz bang things they can do. Now, if we go through a bunch of computational strategies, one that's really key when it comes to health, because so much of our health data, quote unquote, information is getting recorded by clinical providers and by patients in their reported outcomes in text. So having a sense of these text mining and getting meaningful insights from large volumes of unstructured text data, both corpus of data, 
audio collective text or corpora, many corpuses, corpora is the plural of corpus. Um, so that medical literature, clinical notes, patient narratives, those all can be not only analyzed, but tied to other things. So you can try and identify certain things within them. And there's Python libraries to help with that. And there's large language models to also interact more directly with on that. Um, and yes, size spacing is a great one. Thank you, Danielle. Let's see that. Um, so um, and just in terms of some use cases, we've got, it's been around a long time doing natural language processing in a rule-based format. And that came in very handy in the National Public Court collaboratively you see on the right-hand side here, as a young you who was at the Mayo Clinic at the time, um, that they had a whole working thing in there that they had a lot of the codes for diagnoses and lab values and all these other structured data formats, but they got so much more by applying an NLP engine to it. It's there. And then anyways, we got into things beyond initial early as a code where we saw people were just going on and on. I really feel for people with long code that how do you make sense of this whole constellation of symptoms that just don't abate long after your infection? Well, one way to do it is using a latent Dirichlet -like allocation um, algorithm and look at topics, the topic of symptoms you have and how they are over time and look at them relative to your COVID diagnosis as you see in this lower left here. Um, and then you might see that it is versus some other, you know, randomly chosen date that's sort of a mock infection date. That's another one. And these, you know, the links to these are right in the slides to look at. That that, that is, um, this topic modeling was sort of a bag of words idea of like, I get the school corpus of text. What are some topics that it seems to be talking about? And you can do that with you know, the narratives and codes, but also with um, the free text of the clinical notes. And regardless of whether you're using those sort of methods or like a large language model, you want to have trust in how this any, any NLP model could all be done. So I'm sharing here, courtesy of I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the trust framework that you look back at. Now, we said that the expert system was done by rules in the, the National Code Report Collaborative, but you might have other systems about it that you want to make decisions. And that's one whole area of artificial intelligence here. Using decision trees and expert systems, there's one for just looking at how to determine the best way to, with a completely new disease at the time it was, COVID-19, how they did that in this one example here, but in this interactive journal medical research. I think that's it not only help support decisions, but make it sort of transparent to the users, like the clinicians, they got to see these decision trees, yes, no, all on the side of this sort of busy rule, this visualization graphically. You'll be able to do this, something like that yourself with some of our more recent Python libraries like expert based on prior things like trying to If you actually the point where you're just not trying to just deal with treatment or you're trying to make sense of text to know what's present or absent, if you actually want to say, this applying this medication helps COVID-19 or it doesn't. So hydroxychloroquine versus, you know, Paxlovid, <laughs> you would want to get some causal inference methods. And there's a lot that's already being done. Um, a lot of it actually is some of the biggest things I can mention if you look at the article on the back. Like, but there's a lot of packages in development and there'll be more, many more soon. Some of them even dealing with network dependencies like moss spider. Uh, when it comes to uh, things like Deborah and I work on together, like common data elements, a lot of um, semantics of these, you know, knowing that you can fuse disparate data sources together is reinforced by having knowledge graphs or ontologies, ways to express the relationships as best known in, in human knowledge. And that was leveraged in this one thing from human phenotype ontology about a collection of symptoms in long COVID. And we use semantic similarity in this one paper to, you know, figure out what are the what are the most common um, phenotypes that show up together in certain subgroups of long COVID versus others, and they, you know, high and low semantic similarity. But how did you discover that? We had to use another sort of algorithm, sort of genetic evolution of an ontology, adding changing the branches like I'm showing here. You can get involved with that too various libraries we have left here. If you get into something where you yourself are trying to improve a process, there are artificial intelligence um, 
avenues to do that as well from pm for pi or from there are two examples to the right if you wanted to get into some sort of like you know automated clothing classification that's exactly what machines are built to do all these very tedious but detail-oriented tasks to free us up to think more about the bigger picture questions and there's things like medcat and PyCare as well as you see here with you know sort of um within a certain cohort the diseases that showed up um but in the end any workflow any one of these above things you would want it to be at least transparent and know how you got the results you got so that gets into decision support systems but they ought to have explainability and here are two very helpful python libraries that um we can have and uncovered, and I've actually used in some of my collaborations with people using the Ontario Health Record data, SHAP for Shapley's, um, and then the local interpretable model and Nazi expectations. So those are ones to come back to when you have some nice work ones there. And I appreciate Daniel also putting that high LDA bid. That's a very great topic, Molly, in this relation library. Thanks. We can obtain everything in the chat here. Well, when it comes to semantic analysis for data integration, like we talked about doing the common data analysts that gather prospectively, yet having it map a little bit the same things in the American community survey, like Debbie was talking about, it really helps to have things that can act over um, semantic frameworks like ontologies. And ontogpd is another one, and some of the other ones that tend to already get live and already too would be very helpful. Um, and it's become a very key thing in recent things where we have these large language models that you know you talk you might have heard about prompt engineering how do i frame my question to something like chat gpt to get a very much more useful answer well here there's you can look at a wikipedia entry but there's a way to have certain additional auxiliary information encoded so that's where you prompt a large language model you're getting even better answers and that's called the true log level generation, something that's going to be tested out with some internal NIH processes here. So we can help more of you all make better use of intraoperable data. So we covered a bunch of strategies here and employed use cases. Um, um, just a minute, Ken, before yeah. you get to that, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, we're just giving you an overview of some of these. And oh, yeah. Ken has put in a lot of, um, resources for you so you can um we will have these slides available on our web page so you can easily refer back to them and look up all these different um python notebooks jupyter notebooks um that are available um so you can get a little bit of hands-on practice when you um, when these slides are posted, you can go back and review them and then do a little bit more in-depth research yourself. Um, and so I just want to remind people that this is to give you an overview of what to do. That was a whistle stop tour. So like, bang, we're off the train, we're looking around town and we're back on the train again in a lot of ways. But yeah, feel free tomorrow, as I'll say at the end, between 11 a.m. Eastern, 1230 I'll be available on the Zoom for some other questions to follow up and maybe setting you up with some of these quick hands on things. Things can pop up later. Thank you, Deb. And just a little reminder, Ken, it's 3.35. Yeah, I've seen the, the time. So okay. we'll get through AI and we'll get some machine learning here and some key concepts. Um, so what are what is what I did mention that at some glances with some of our examples that we just blazed through terms of areas of AI application. Uh, a lot of them deal with um, algorithms and having had trained in an AI system using certain algorithms. And very popular ones, we should make sure we get covered. So you at least have heard that. And again, this write-up, which I will not walk through, but it has the links and it goes back to this again, this great article that everybody pointed out. Convolutional neural networks, very things uh, amazing things that they've done with images about a decade ago when it's been better from there. When they wanted to look at things like um, sequential data and how images might change over time, you look into how things might be recurrent. As convolutions were only feed forward, you wanted something that would like link the information back and reweight things as more things were learned and back out into a lot of things like recurrent neural networks, um, innovating on that. But there were some 
some technical issues about how that information of how data can change your different parameters gradient. It got to be so small that it wouldn't work for pulling point operations, and there had to be some fix up for that. That led to other things like other innovations like long short term memory networks. And then later on, the idea of attention, I think, and that was a real game changer. And this is before the pandemic, but I was at a session in the data science meetup, and I think I would encourage everyone to look at the data science meetups in the local area if you want to learn more about data science. Um, about Google's Earth, the bi directional encoder representations for transformers. Um, so named because of Ernie Burt in Sesame Street. You gotta love um, people referencing Sesame Street, but that's the precursor to opening as GP2, two, and then three, and now four things like BAR. They're all part of these large language models are based on transformers. Um, and we've seen a lot of what can happen with those. The things that are sort of more of this structured data over time as well. Another key thing is key learning or quality learning, which is kind of off of like, um, you know, how sequential decision making work. And I'll talk about reinforcement learning being the real uh, driver for innovation in that space. And it gets into things like in healthcare specifically, like you, you have a condition that has a certain class of medications, you try one, you have bad side effects, or it's not, it's not helping you, you try a different one. And that sequential thing, that's the a key place for reinforcement learning. Um, so, in summary, we could look at that with all these algorithms, you really have, especially if you bring an ensemble of these methods together, you really have a huge flexibility to deal with multiple data modalities. It's not like you have enough data. And it can be quite robust to some of these both out of distribution or things, data that you're not like data has been trained on ideas. One key thing you want, especially in high stakes areas like healthcare, is it to be explainable. Sometimes it's explain multiple extra steps, and there's a, a, a nice archive paper in the last this past month that got into a nice framework for that. They might use the idea of the word interpretable, but it's not interpretable in the term that it's really. So that's a weakness of AI. It's not interpretable. It's an assumption that's dense, and yet the assumptions are typically not transparently assessed. And you saw the saliency maps of those images of the husky that can also get the transverse loop for all you can tell. From the networks, what it was looking at and paying attention to. Um, and I think the link to share in the chat. Um, yeah, I we might have to do that. Well, we get the, with the links there. Yeah, any of the links that are in the chat, we'll get back out to you. Yeah, any we'll links that are in the slides, we will have for you. You should have the slides. Yeah, we'll take care of that. Okay. All right, and here's where we'll have Luca talk about AI bias. Thanks, Luca. I can advance the slides for you, or you can take over your question. Thank you so much, Ken. So we'll take over. Perfect. Can you all see my screen? Now we can. Great. Perfect. So I wanted to provide you with a quick overview on AI bias. And the reason why that is important is that many algorithms are being used um, to influence decisions affecting people's health. And they're leveraging big data. And how they work is that they use training data that specifies what the correct outputs are for some people or objects to train a model which is then applied to other people or objects to make predictions about what the correct outputs are for them. And um, the problem here is that these algorithms run the risk of replicating and amplifying human biases affecting protected groups. And this can lead to outcomes that are systematically less favorable to those groups. And bias can originate from many uh, points in the algorithm development process or from the data itself. And I really like this diagram, which kind of gives you an idea of how data-driven bias from bias samples or data gaps uh, can interact with algorithmic bias from either imbalanced classes or training bias, and also with human bias from societal prejudices or uh, power imbalances to lead to biased outcomes. And I also really like this diagram, which kind of gives you an idea of how these biased 
AI design and deployment practices can lead to application injustices, which in turn lead to real world patterns of health inequality and discrimination, which are going to be reflected in the data that reflects that world. And again, the data is going to be used to train new algorithms that as a consequence are inevitably gonna be biased and this cycle continues. And I would also like to give you um, three examples of AI bias to make it a little more concrete. So uh, I give you this example of how an algorithm was being used to predict which patients would benefit from extra medical care. And the problem was that the algorithm flagged healthier white patients as more at risk than sicker black patients. And it had the highest scores concentrated in the most affluent suburbs of Boston. And the problem here was that the algorithm was using a seemingly race-blind metric, so how much patients would cost the healthcare system in the future, to allocate those resources. But the problem, of course, was that cost isn't a race-neutral measure of healthcare need, because, of course, white patients had better access to care, and they were spending less money than Black patients. And so the solution here was to tweak the algorithm, of course, to account for that. Another example, which Ken cited uh, earlier, um, was how the inclusion uh, of a coefficient for Black patients in an equation that was being used to estimate kidney function, um, an inclusion that was based on small poor quality studies, was leading to um, an increase in kidney function estimates for Black individuals by nearly 16%. And this, of course, altered guideline-based diagnosis and referrals for care. And the problem here was that um, including those adjustments was ignoring the substantial diversity within self-identified Black patients and also between Black patients and other racial or ethnic minority groups. And the solution here was, of course, to adjust the equation, removing the race-based adjustment. And a final example uh, that I want to give you is, uh, this is a pretty famous one. Um, so in algorithm was helping physicians uh, distinguish between images of benign and malignant moles. And the problem here was that lesions on patients of color were less likely to be diagnosed. And the problem here was that the algorithm was being trained on a repository of skin images from primarily fair skin populations, because those populations, of course, had uh, more access to care. And the solution here involved expanding um, these data to include as many skin types as possible. So you can see that it's really important to test for bias, both in data sets and also in models. And I'd like to give you a really brief overview on general strategies and techniques that can be used for test, uh, to test biases. And of course, it's just an overview. So I would invite you to um, learn more on your own based on my summary. So let's see how you can test for bias in data sets. One of the most important techniques is exploratory data analysis, which involves uh, visualizing and summarizing the main characteristics of the data set uh, using histograms, box plots, summary, statistics. And the goal here is to understand the data distribution and to identify any outliers or imbalances or biases. And I'll give you an example uh, for each one of these techniques to make it a little more um, and concrete. So if this analysis reveals that a data set on job applicants is skewed towards a specific gender, then it might indicate a bias in the sampling process. And for each technique, I'll actually give you some Python libraries that you can use to conduct uh, those assessments. So they're going to be on the slides. Demographic analysis um, is another technique which focuses on, of course, demographic data. And it breaks down the data set based on demographic attributes, such as age, gender, ethnicity, and it analyzes the distribution within each group. And the goal here, of course, is again to identify imbalances or overrepresentations in specific groups. So uh, let's make let's give you an example. So in a healthcare data set, if one demographic group is overrepresented, then this may lead to biased predictions. Data certification. Again, a data set is divided into subgroups based on relevant features, and each subgroup 
is then analyzed independently. And this helps detect biases that, of course, may exist disproportionately in specific subgroups. As an example, uh, in a credit scoring dataset, stratifying by income levels can reveal biases in credit approval rates across income levels. And finally, this is interesting. Um, there are a lot of bias detection tools out there. Really, really, really interesting. I, two examples are IBM's AI Fairness 360 or Google's What If tool. And these tools offer automated metrics for assessing bias in data sets and models. And um, they provide quantitative measures. So they facilitate also a systematic approach to bias detection. And AI Fairness 360, for example, provides a set of algorithms to evaluate fairness across various demographic groups. And Google's What If tool um, is pretty interesting because it, it allows to um, interactively explore model predictions and visualize outcomes across different subsets of data. So I would invite you to really explore those there. Really, really interesting. And I would also like to point out several techniques that can be employed to address bias in data sets. So, of course, oversampling involves increasing the representation of underrepresented groups in the data set to ensure a more balanced distribution. And the same goal is achieved by undersampling, um, that is, reducing overrepresented groups. The use of synth synthetic data um, also introduces uh, these artificially generated data points that can mitigate imbalances. And of course, re-weighting or adjusting the importance of specific instances during model training also helps address bias. And of course, making sure that um, your data set uh, is representative of the real population. So updating and expanding those data sets with diverse representative samples also contributes to minimizing bias. And finally, to test for bias in algorithms, um, there are many techniques you can use. One is performance metrics disaggregation, uh, which consists of evaluating model performance metrics, so for example, accuracy, precision, separately for different subgroups. And um, it is important because disparities in performance metrics across groups may indicate bias. And I'll give you an example. So if we are testing a healthcare algorithm disaggregating accuracy by racial groups, and we see that there is a slightly lower accuracy for Black patients, then we might have a bias. And fixes, of course, include root cause analysis and adjustments to the algorithm. A second technique we can use is confusion metrics. So as you, uh, I'm sure you know, confusion metrics is a table that summarizes the performance of a, of a classification algorithm by comparing the predicted versus the actual values for false positives, false negatives, et cetera. And disparities in errors can pinpoint areas where bias may exist. So an example here, um, if I'm analyzing a medical diagnosis algorithm using confusion metrics, and um, I want to evaluate the model's effectiveness in making medical diagnosis, if there is a difference in false positives between genders, that might indicate a bias. And of course, I'll have to maybe adjust the decision thresholds uh, in the model or retrain it with data that is more balanced or you know, consult uh, with domain experts. Fairness indicators are um, also important because they provide some sort of a structured approach to measure bias. So if we integrate those fairness indicators, which are measures that assess whether a model's prediction treat different groups equitably into the model evaluation process, then we are building that structured approach that really helps identify biases. And an example of fairness indicators that you can use to do this uh, is the TensorFlow fairness indicators by Google. And I'll give you an example. Uh, they can be used to compare, for example, prediction accuracies of the healthcare decision support algorithm across different racial groups. And um, fixes, of course, if a bias is identified, include retraining the algorithm with balanced data or adjusting decision thresholds. And sensitivity uh, analysis is another technique you can use to identify biases. So uh, it consists in um, assessing how changes in model input features impact predictions. 
And uh, the way this is done is you tweak one feature at a time and you observe how the model responds. So if the predictions of the model change. And this helps identify features that uh, disproportionately influence the model. So I'll give you an example. In a healthcare decision support algorithm uh, that is being used to predict diabetes risk, um, if I assess how variations in input variables, so for example, age or uh, BMI, body mass index, um, impact predictions for different racial groups, and I find that the algorithm is um, relying disproportionately on a single variable that only affects certain groups, then we might have a bias. And so fixes here might include recalibrating the model to minimize the influence of the variable or retraining it with a more diverse data set. And finally, uh, counterfactual analysis. So this technique involves exploring um, hypothetical scenarios uh, and determining the minimal changes needed in input features to alter a model's prediction. And um, it helps understand the model's decision boundaries. And I'll give you an example. So in a credit approval algorithm, if a loan application from a certain racial group is denied, is consistently denied, then the analysis um, involves identifying the minimal changes needed in the application features. So for example, changes in income or changes in credit score uh, for um, approval. And this can shed light on potential biases. And fixes here, of course, include adjusting the decision thresholds or mitigating the impact of sensitive features on, again, retraining the model. So I hope this was a helpful overview and you have uh, references to Python libraries that you can use to conduct all of those analysis. And hopefully you can refer back to these slides uh, to learn more. Perfect. Uh, Ken, I'll, I hope this was helpful. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, definitely. Thank you very much, Luca. I really need stuff. Oh, yeah. I'll share my screen. It's just not off where they were. Um, I like these frameworks for how to test with the bias, that how you put those together is really helpful. Let's go through on like just like just focusing on certain metrics. Uh, Ken, you're kind of Ken, you're kind yes. of uh, low muddled again. E either talk up or something. Okay, how's this? There you, you go. Well, better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's a matter of uh, this one set of earbuds have been for me for a few years. Maybe they're uh, you're good now. Kind of like, okay. And it's so, three fifty five. 55. I know we're looking at uh, the time here. Look, I'm willing to take it uh, well beyond. We want to get through some things in machine learning, and then probably just blaze through. And a lot, of, like as we come to pickathons, you may have a set of slides you look at on your own, like about the Python libraries. Some of those beyond that, uh, the ones that Luca just talked about. Um, and I would say my internet connection is unstable, even though I'm on a network within the NIH. Huh. Oh well. All right, so basically it's a bridge building trailblazer in machine learning. A lot of it's based out of statistical and more traditional methods, but it's all been um, amped up with the availability of better computing and more advanced algorithms, uh, more refined algorithms, I should say. It all falls under the AI umbrella, and it's really about learning and applying learning. And it's not like the cynical definition I heard last week, <laughs> which is at the bottom. I continue going on here, like, you know, we're just looking at basically how do you quantify relationships that you sort of see in the data, like there are slopes and the lines here of these different sepal length, petal length within our iris. Classic iris data set, which, you know, will be one of our examples that are linked in these slides that you can be able to work with right within the shared Terra platform. Um, and I did try to get a mention of the other data, like the community survey and birth of data. Maple risk factors uh, survey data that it's a uh, system data that are in the share as well. Um, you can look at those. So various scales just to get your your chops down as far as you're working and coding and getting some interaction with the data and then getting the data that you actually want to learn things from. And that learning things could be novel patterns, clustering and mixture modeling, meaning the, the data are really a mixture of this different subgroups all smushed together. Like you can see if you just looked along the x-axis of this pedal um, measure at the bottom, pedal width, the green and the red would totally overlap one another. But you can actually see across sepal length that they don't quite overlap fully. 
So you can get these sort of ellipses that sort of show where is this cluster here? And then to really get to it, it gets into this mention thing in the mission for principal component analysis. You know, it goes back to 1901, <laughs> but it probably took a lot more calculation then. Um, you could easily get it with a single line of code and plot it here, and you see these independent units, things that are explaining 73% of the variance and 23% of the variance. That's almost 100%, right? So this, this third principal component um, could probably be a, a whole, would not have much leftover variability. And, and you can kind of discover these underlying things with that and the data reduction technique like that. And these are some of the things of applications that kind of were trying to be talked about within um, actual hands-on examples. And the last thing I found, and just keep in mind that phase two of that whole and I need to case and repository data center challenge is still underway. We'll learn some more about that. But in terms of learning, how do we get our machines to learn? Let's focus on this thing about supervised versus semi supervised versus unsupervised learning, taking you back about uh, 23 years almost to uh, when uh, the chief executive was reading the group of school age kids from a book. That was a meme that became how people talk about supervised learning that I'll read reviews here. Um, it gets to the extent of supervision. Who's supervising who? Well, supervised learning, we're looking at a bunch of examples and we're labeling explicitly. These are apples, these are oranges. These are apples, these are oranges. And you come out and machines are the apples are not the same thing as oranges. It's like we use our often things that um, if each instance is given one and exactly one label that will be supervised learning and it eventually learns how to distinguish the two through the algorithms we've talked about, which is regression, support vector machine, et cetera, et cetera. So um, going on to semi-supervised learning, we might have something a little bit more vague than you all and maybe some certain social sciences may be aware of the more shocking plots. Um, you know, you may give it some information about each instance, but you may not give it you don't label every instance entirely. You may just label a subset with that, with a given label, like red shows up on the one on the right. Um, or one thing that we wouldn't be able to do here is that it's semi-supervised. It would never pick up with that. There's no picture that lacks a mirror image. Just, that's how these are created, unless you add those sort of images in. So every learning effectively that we do is supervised to some extent because it's what data we bring to it, right? So but the key thing is only some of the instances are given the label, distinguish labeling pattern overall. And there might be have to be a tweak in the algorithm to say that of the, of the unlabeled, some may still be have, could have had a label, but you still have to learn what that label would be. Here in unsupervised learning, you're just trying to say, what are the aspects and features that distinguish these things apart from each other? Well, if you know, one side it may be a four-eyed fox or four-eyed wolf, and the other side, it may be a drum circle, people having kidneys and butterflies flying around them. Who knows if that's really what it would do? I'd love to see what a large item model would do with these actual more shocking plots, but um, that's one example. The only choice parts of instances used to label them, we don't provide it any information. We're not supervising it in its algorithm. And, and one key thing about unsupervised learning is that you can elicit patterns that aren't a priori thought of by individuals. Like, you know, a hybrid orange apple, or as some of you might know from the Freakonomics uh, book of a couple of decades back, you know, you cut open an apple and you see orange stuff inside. <laughs> so that's one advantage of having unsupervised learning. And we had other rubrics that help recap what it is for the rest of us from uh, a prior thing I found. Same team that had um, uh, some overlap, like Dr. Summer Rankin. And others have been part of the team that worked on that chronic kidney disease, the end stage kidney disease thing. And they, you know, some key things that you've heard about elsewise where you're trying to get a label like this is a cat, this is a dog, cats are not cats effectively on the right hand side. That's sort of a classification task. It could also be sort of as regression. You're identifying certain values, one being the outcome as the, the label and its distribution, and you're trying to have it put in terms of other things. And in terms of things that we've done within our own um, uh, milieu of like NADDK, there's a disease one, acute kidney injury that was done by the folks at DeepMind using electronic health records. They partnered with uh, groups in the UK as well as the Veterans Affairs and Veterans Health Association uh, Administration. 
to, to try and predict it ahead of time because it was a really a big problem. And this came out just before the pandemic. So it might, you know, in the once that followed, our a lot of our attention went elsewhere. But you can look up things and you can see that it uses some of the actual Python libraries that have been mentioned elsewhere here, including what Luke was mentioning. So and these are ones you could probably use in the share as well. When it comes to unsupervised learning, again, it goes back to some classical stat and epi methods that then have been completely enhanced by AI and machine learning, like things that look at similarities, clustering, sometimes things that stand out a lot different from others, like anomaly detection is another instance. For an example, unsupervised learning within some NAH funded work, there's a, an IDK funded team, they found these three distinct, just in terms of genetics, three distinct subtypes of type two diabetes as visualized within this sort of heat map over network. But, um, visualization to the right kind of almost looks like something uh molecular biology but in terms of a macrobiology scale there's a non-age funded team in ci that looked at mammograms and tried to accommodate in the issue of breast density getting in the way of clear diagnoses of risk of breast cancer and in fact the cheetah butterfly was one of the uh, authors in the team she herself had encountered that problem but she was her own ai researcher and so pursued that question, trying to resolve it. Um, and, you know, if this doesn't look familiar, this the images are just one instance of one image as it gets classified. But overall, across all the ones in our study, you eventually get what's called a confusion matrix, that both Luca and I talked about as a way of looking at how well um, an authoritative figure like the radiologist, the actual thing versus the deep learning model predicts. Um, so that was a sort of a blend of where unsupervised led to a very helpful supervised learning. Experience. So what, um, let's do a check now if we have a chance with the help of Kevin on uh, these recent things. Uh, following just the key concept of supervised versus unsupervised learning. Now, Pretty wordy, so let me try and walk us through this together. All right, what's the following? Uh, oh, this is an, about interpretability. Yeah. Can you try to find your way further along in the slide up? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right, this is one we've not talked about yet pre processing. Oh, okay. I'm going to go back up. Okay. Okay list. Okay, there we go. Perfect. What best? There we go. What do you say meets the definition of unsupervised learning? Okay, back to our Irish data. You got a new flower blooms measures, unlabeled floors, predict which species uses statistical regression to predict labels from a older culturalist. They know when it's this species, but they don't know, they're unsure if it's not in some cases. Or you give a collection of symptoms associated with long COVID, which co-occur most often, and you group the subtypes. With semantic similarity, like the example we talked about earlier, with a specific algorithm. Or we can give a collection of symptoms associated with long COVID, and we see which ones occur most often with, quote, brain fog using XG boost to extend gradient boost in trees implementation. Or is it all the above or none of the above? Which seems the most like an unsupervised learning thing, um, approach, I should say, machine learning. And we're going to have all the same options for remaining things here. Um, and it looks like we're getting feedback that it's all of the above. Okay. Unsupervised. Again, it's a degree of supervision. To what extent are you letting the algorithm know the status of certain instances of labels, quote unquote? All of these sound very much like unsupervised learning. At some point, unsupervised learning might be part of that. Okay. Let's settle down to reach past 20. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And maybe with that, what I'll do is um, 
before we go into the next question, I'll take over and maybe we'll do a little bit on semi-supervised because it seems like we're going to have the same options for a later one. It seems like we need a little bit more discussion. So I will take over now. This is part of why we're doing the slide up. We can look at our mutual understanding. So this is where we talked about supervised and unsupervised. Are you giving it labels? Or are you just letting it find its own patterns? Here's semi-supervised. Everything's by some extent, because you're giving certain data you've chosen to do it. But look at in this case, we've got a classing example of different scores, and only the green instances are labeled. These blue pluses, they're actual positives, but they're just unlabeled. And we don't even label the negatives. All we do is we give it only the positives, and the algorithm will adapt iteratively to realize that there's a lot more overlap of these blue instances with the green labeled positives than there is with these, this, this distribution of oranges. And so eventually it will figure out that some of the unlabeled are positives as in the blue and some of the unlabeled are actually not positives or quote negatives. It's a classic example to do that here. And this kind of might help us distinguish a bit more. This is probably brought in where it wasn't talked about in prior things on so unsupervised and supervised, but semi-supervised, what does that mean? Um, by it actually, um, sorry, it actually lets you know that sometimes, and we did this with long COVID actually, um, you are only sure of ones that have like, if they went to a long COVID visit, then you knew they were being treated for long COVID. Other ones just had a constellation of symptoms that seemed consistent with that. So you just let them unlabel, and then you had the algorithm distinguish them from the ones that lacked a lot, the same aggregation of constellated labels. So this is semi-supervised learning. We're only giving it yes, positive, and then unlabeled. Um, and there's a whole survey of use cases here. So maybe with that, let's go back to our, um, our actual Slido, if you could, Kevin, with the next one. All right, so the same questions. This time we're looking at supervised learning. We wanna say, are we giving it a label or not? So the flower blooms, all you got from horticulturists is yes or unsure. So sort of positive label or unlabeled. Um, the other one is that you're saying, let's look at symptoms associated with long COVID. Which ones occur most often? What are the patterns that shake out from this algorithm? The third one is a collection of symptoms associated with long COVID, but they co-occur with one specific outcome that's either there or it's not. So you label whether a person has brain fog or they there's no label of brain fog. It's not always clear, but which of these three do you think seems the most like a task of supervised learning? Let's go for the votes. Or votes in. This is always helpful for me. It's how to how you phrase your different examples and what it does to distinguish other fairly subtle, otherwise overlapping concepts. All right, we set a lot of 15. Maybe we have a more votes from people. Get it over 20 and we'll call it. People get it over 20. The thing is that there's not any one real right answer. We're just trying to help see with our current understanding what is meant by this. And some things. They're in a gray zone. They'll be on the border. All right, maybe we'll stick with 19. Stop that. Um, so you see, most everyone said, okay, given new flowers blooms, I give it to you. You guys, 
went that way, maybe you're going off of how other people were, but it definitely has a label of yes, that is this one species. I could have been more clear in, in saying that, uh, you know, unsure was just unlabeled. It was meant to be unlabeled. But you know what? That's because you all are probably think very critically about this other one about brain fog. Just because we don't have something electronic health record about brain fog doesn't mean it's not there. And that's a very good research design thing that Edwin's showing. I'm not fully totally looking to that. And really, it almost could be all of the above if we had, depending on how if we label things. And the subtype here might be that. So with that um, sort of summary, we've got the same exact things. What if we just said, next one. Thank you, Kevin. And oh, I want to get my stuff out of the way here. So if we said semi supervised, this is where you say, oh, I'm giving you a label on some and other ones I'm misleading unlabeled. What if we said we're working with electronic health records and brain fog is only put in there if there's a positive report? We just, like, people may be suffering from it, but it may not show up in their health record. If I said that, what would you vote for? It's a semi supervised learning task. Again, the same options, which, which sounds more like semi-supervised, where you label some instances, but other ones get unlabeled. If we say electronic health records, I'm trying to meet you guys where you were with the prior question. I really meant the unsure would be the unlabeled of it here. But if we really say we're working with electronic health records and lack of a record doesn't mean a record of lack. People would have to be tested for brain fog or not to know. And I could have written this much more clearly. So what am I leading you to? Let's see what the results are as they come in with, with our 12. Okay. Okay. So again, a, a blend. A blend. So which one's following group groups? We're labeling some. All right. And maybe Maybe part of this is being a little too close to some of this research involving long COVID and electronic health records. Um, it wasn't as clear to say with the uh, species for Jenny Ben example on the first point, but it seems like you all have chosen about the leading thing is this, you know, which subgroups occur. That was actually intended to be, let's just find out what patterns fall out. And if you're just trying to find out what patterns you fall out, you're not giving any labels, that would be unsupervised learning. So it, again, it's a blend of unsupervised and supervised to have semi-supervised. And this is sort of a subtle, subtle nuance that doesn't come along very easily and probably shows that my question wasn't well posed for you all to help reinforce which is which. So, I was trying to hint as we were saying this that maybe, you know, only partially labeling brain fog with that trying health record might be it. Originally, the yes, unsure, the unsure was supposed to be unlabeled, <laughs> and that would be it. But the idea is semi supervised, you only label some. Others are unlabeled, and the, the algorithm will adapt iteratively to try and pull in the unlabeled to say how many of those are similar to the ones we know are labeled positive and that would be more semi-supervised but again the idea is this this nuance is not as important because it's driven by you as a data scientist if you have labels and you're going to make use of them you'll be doing supervised or semi-supervised learning if you have no labels you'll be doing unsupervised that's the key take home is that you know conceptually they may be very subtle to distinguish among but it's not going to matter if you keep in mind you're the one who's in the driver's seat choosing what these tasks are along with your collaborators. Okay, with that, I, I'll go ahead and oops, I just didn't want to indicate there, but maybe it'll go away. Why don't you stop sharing the screen? Thank you, Kevin. Bring it back to our slide set here. And it's 4 15, Ken. Yeah, 4 15. We want to be done in 10 minutes. Oh, wait, do we have yeah. 10 yeah. minutes? 
Um, reinforcement learning. This is where we talk about the Q learning, quality learning rubric. And I just wanted to point out a nice, very helpful um, Nature Medicine article on this. One key issue in um, serial, I'm oh, sorry, I'm like, see, see, it flies too fast. Um, it's that machine learning, you get a sequence of decisions and you try to optimize the overall end result. Like the health of a person experiencing sepsis in an intensive care unit, like they show it right. There's all these decisions that clinicians must make. Do you mechanically ventilate? Yes or no. Do you state them at that point? Yes or no. Do you, uh, you add drugs called vasopressors to um, have them respond to their septic situation, their bodies uh, accommodate and try to avoid the failure. And a lot of times there's just one patient you're not going to see, just you're going to see one trajectory. You need to have a lot of different patients across many different trajectories to be able to train an algorithm that'll say, like, oh, if the path up through a certain point went a certain way, we know the optimal choice from this point forward. That's reinforcement learning. And it's done with that Q learning algorithm. This article, which I'll point out in the link here in the, in the slides, is that it gets really tough to have reliable take home points from this and reusable algorithms because that large group of varied people that range from blue to red here, that's what this symbol is supposed to be, a double the arrow. Um, as you take things forward in their own sepsis from time zero and you look at these various questions, fewer and fewer of them um, will be available to provide information about certain policy. And some of them, it's not clear even what would happen to them. It's great decision points. So it has become very tough. It's it's huge in a lot of things in gaming and robotics, autonomous systems, very, very large. I mean, you can think, when does it have become high stakes in a lot of autonomous systems? Like some of our driverless cars, where there have been some bad things happening there that the reinforcement learning did not adapt. And that's a similar concern in health when it comes to reinforcement learning, like it is in the sepsis condition. But with that, with reinforcement learning, you now you've covered supervised, super, um, semi supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. It's all sort of falling into this rubric of machine learning as it's shown in this Python, thanks from uh, um, the same team that worked um, on the radicate disease that uh, example. But I would want to say is that, again, if you're not clear about how these vary from one another, um, we can always bear in mind that you have um, agency in what you do. You're choosing the task and you're formulating it yourself with so many expertise collaborators, which may include yourself and taking it forward as to what's the most appropriate. The flavor and the nuance amongst them is less important to the applicability to your research. And here we have a research in this, you know, they had a race agnostic machine learning thing for looking at in-hospital mortality. Well, they realized there was differential performance among race agnostic versus one that was race specific that took race into account. And they wanted to try to improve on it. did improve as a machine learning algorithm on something more traditional like just regression, but it still needed further improvement by and had finessing how it considers race. And that was similar to this um, CKD use case. As you can see, there's quite a different, there's some different colored box plots here, varying age distributions across the race, ethnicity, subgroups. And that went along hand in hand with varying mortality. What you can look at it with some Python libraries is how to not only fit these, but some other ones like Luke had mentioned, which will also come up later and are in the slides of how to assess both the explainability of something like the prediction model used in this instance, XGBoost algorithm, but also how, whether or not it seemed relatively within the parameters of being a fair uh, prediction, or was it performing outside of what you would want uh, and not as you intend, as in terms of when you first start someone analysis, here is your chance in the next 90 days of not making it. You need to really consider. And so that's, there's the breast density cancer above. You can go from things like this tabular data to like this image analysis. 
And there's the, the melanoma model that, that Lutner pointed out. That's a counterexample where they actually realized there's a big shortfall in uh, instances with pigmented skin, of, uh, skin of varying pigments that would thus accurately identify melanoma from the open nine um, skin lesions. Breast cancer, breast density example is another thing. Or, you know, we shouldn't let breast density do that. Other applications that are big in healthcare is like remote patient monitoring. In my institute, continuous glucose monitoring, with blood sugar monitoring. Actually, a lot of people have those devices now. And some of them are using them for active insulin dosing for those that are insulin dependent in terms of managing their diabetes. Um, sometimes it's done on a population level. Like we talked about, one I skipped over quickly was the, the Optum. Um, Algorithm. This one here, uh, we'll hear about quite a bit um, in the news from uh, Ziad Obermeyer, but uh, we mentioned the last Sikaton that it was always flagging healthy white patients as more at risk than sicker black patients. What? So, what they needed to do is they needed to tweak the algorithm and change how their algorithm was applying itself to, to mitigate those. Um, Another example is just like I was saying earlier, and when you, you you can take some agency, if you don't, if you lack some of the data you, you would ideally have on an individual level, use those supplements on an, on an area level. Things that are, are gonna be in from the American Community Survey in the share platform, it's aggregate markers of social determinants of health. And just that, the underdiagnosis rates and the overdiagnosis rates in this one instance of uh, heart failure and the risk disparities involved, they were really improved by this one um, group's team, as you can see in the, in the link to the news uh, update, as well as the paper that went along with it. And, you know, a lot of these incorporation ways to incorporate them, they can be done with scikit-learn, pandas, numpy, with some of the fundamental Python packages that are in share. And as was pointed out, earlier by Preeti and others, sometimes these other area things that may actually be social concerns that are like economic, uh, environmental terms of health. We can't leave those as latent un unaccounted for factors when there is a lot of public data that you can get down to a very tight area and up to four very distinct variables according to this group that a uh, lab that's come around out of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences that also has NIMHD material uh, Things. And some you can rewatch the video cast that talks about a broader set of work than that. But take advantage of it. And, and if it's not something that's in share, you can request that it be brought in. The idea of, of having these various things that Luca went over and had a mitigate bias is, is it's really just a few steps away when you have like whole packages like the AI Fairness 360. And uh, the fact that it has, if you learn scikit-learn within Python, it, there's a compatible application program interface that lets you go right directly to the, the hosted AI 360 thing to try and work out various iterations of current modeling's approach relative to certain bias and fairness measures. Now, even if you can't do that with your own model, you can do it afterward. They fall into this post-processing realm, just as they showed in this Kate and Haas review. That's what a lot of do with a lot of black box things. But hopefully, with a lot of us being uh, in the shared community, very familiar with some of these um, data sources, you can do even more creation in the pre-processing and looking at what training data is getting used. So again, I would really, really reiterate, if you can't do it on the data side, on the results side, and you're able to get, if you can't do it on the algorithm side and in processing, you're using someone else's thing, you should be able to try and do it on the data side or the results side, the pre-processing, the post-processing. Um, and that's one example of, of what was done in this chronic kidney disease. And if they really did some post-processing to make sure, and this was in some slides that were not, there was not time to cover as I'm about to come up on with my own slides. Um, that, that you know they did some fairness assessment of categories of interest, give it some additional insight into how the model was performing in different patient categories for these people that would reach end stage kidney disease, start dialysis. What is their chance of dying in the first 90 days? It varied quite a bit, and you can see that they did that in the full report, which is on the slides. Um, so I think um, 
I would rather stop here and do the conception check. The remaining slides and get into some strategies, a lot of Python libraries, um, some other things that if it's not been, if there's not implementation available yet in Python, which you can get through, and then some decision graphics. What things sort of tilt a work in favor of AIML versus away from uh, traditional stats or epi film? Um, things like there are very multimodal like images and sound signals and other things that usually require deep learning. But sometimes deep learning doesn't do so well as we see how this one, if you want to be farther away from this diagonal line, something like just getting pulmonary failure from an image wasn't easily done. So they would have to use other forms of data and other algorithms as well. And it's as, it's as easy as having these young types trying to get this huge log seesaw out of tilt. So, um, and we're going to get some guiding answer of what to do is it depends on what. Well, that's it's the modalities being strong one. I've got a few more examples like that. The one take home that's probably the best reference is this machine learning cheat sheet that I've had in the past. But what we're also probably trying to do is have a an online reference that can be shared at the time of later thinkathons and people can return to especially as you get more hands-on and start to work with things yourself. So with that, I think we'll stop this whistle stop tour and whistle stop tour and, um, you know, you will have these and all the various things, but I'll, I'll close at least by saying I'm open for office hours tomorrow on 1230 to, to one, um, as I say here, and uh, I really appreciate your attention and, and, and a lot of the great, fantastic mentions in the chat of what we can do. To, to and consider as we try to embark on this journey together as uh, new data science, new or returning data science practitioners in the shared platform. So Ken, thank you very much. Um, you covered a lot of information. Um, oh, wow. For those of you on the call, um, still, again, these were the slides will all be posted, and um, they will be. Um, they will be posted on the on the share webpage for thinkathons in about two or three weeks. It takes us a little bit of time to get them um, 508 compliant. Um, many of you that are on this call probably have some knowledge about about computations and data science. We are going to start um, doing research. So there was a question on this is very theoretical. Yes, it is theoretical because we weren't trying to get in to teach you how to do these things, but to expose you to when you have this problem or you want to do this perspective, this is what typically is done. It doesn't mean that it's always done. It's just what typically is done. And of course, I'm always into this uh, approach that think outside of the box and I can assure you that there will be no AI that doesn't have some sort of bias to it. And that's just a given. It's not like you can get rid of biases in AI, but you can address them. And that is the whole um, point of this presentation is think through what you're doing in preparation so you can prevent as much bias as you can. And then they covered many different areas, like whether it's in the data or in the algorithm or in the implementation. And then check so that they're, so that you can test for those biases as you do the training and the models. We hope to move into the more practical use, not theoretical, as we move into the research. And hopefully we'll try to address some of these um, strategies in the own research that we're gonna conduct. Um, in this is research is actually to help you begin. So you can totally be brand new and never have done cloud computing research. And we hope to do it at a pace where we teach each other and we help each other. Um, some have more content expertise and some have more data science expertise. So just to get a sense of those who would be 
wanting to participate, Luca created a spreadsheet um, that you can sign up to be part of the research. Luca, do you want to talk about that? Of course, I just pasted in the chat um, a link to a form that you can fill in if you want to take a more uh, active role in our upcoming research hackathons. So I would invite you to check that out and sign up. And we really encourage you to fill this out. If you think, it, do, it doesn't mean you have to do it. It's just, if you think you're gonna do it, because we're trying to kind of strategize because oftentimes we get anywhere from a hundred to 300 people on these calls. And it's very hard to create a research project with 300 people. So we're trying to get a sense of how many people will want to do this. So we know how to strategize in putting these research teams together. So we ask you to really fill out the form and help us get a sense of that so that we can make this the best um, teaching experience, mentoring experience, because I think of these research projects both as teaching and mentoring, um, both up and down. So senior people can help with content knowledge and some of you that are already data scientists can help um, with the analytics to teach senior people. So if you can fill out the form, um, that would help us a lot um, to know how to sort of uh, put these all together. And I want you all to be encouraged that we are also, if, uh, if you have not heard of this project, there's another sort of sister program called Aim Ahead. And Aim Ahead has the same sort of goal that we do, which is to increase participation of underrepresented populations in data science cloud computing. They have a much higher level of expertise. And so what we're trying to do is create a training pipeline into doing research. So our research projects are gonna be more hands-on, more work with each other, um, that kind of stuff so that we can get prepared to do a more independent approach to research. And so I want you to um, know that you don't have to have a lot of experience to, to participate in our, our model. And for those of you who are already experts, we'll create a pipeline for you to also then join the Aim Ahead research projects who are also doing health disparities research. Um, one someone last- involves, Someone involves electronic health records. I was excited to learn from- uh, Yeah, AIM 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 last week. Yeah. yeah, in fact, the congressional charge for AIM AHEAD was con <laughs> electronic health records. And again, one of the things that I really encourage all of you is that when we try to do stuff in this platform, we're keeping in mind all the other platforms at NIH. So for instance, Ken works with N3C at um, NCATS, another institute, and they're forming a collaboration with Aim Ahead also so that we can get people exposed to the multiple platforms across NIH. Um, I'm gonna take any questions that anybody has. Um, it's Aim Ahead. Uh, Mark, or uh, could somebody put it in the chat, the link to it, please? Um, is there any questions from anybody um, to answer before we move on to finish the last um, evaluation poll? Um, when will we start the research? Um, we hope to start it maybe in two months. Uh, we might start a little bit next month. And it'll be during our regular Thinkathon time slot because we try to keep these the third Wednesday of every month. But we will also get information out to you all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, we um, the, I see the request in the chat 
we do it as fast as we can. It takes a lot of work. It, it, I mean, if you saw the complication of the slides that Canon um, presented, it, it has to be 508 compliant. We can't post anything that's not 508 compliant. So because of the complexity of the slides, sometimes it takes us two or three weeks to get it done. So um, I apologize for the delay, but we have to comply with government regulations. Um, they also put the links in the uh, chat for Aim Ahead. I will include that on the um, links that I'm gonna send to, to our contractor to send them out to everyone. And um, Kevin, can you put up the last Slido poll for the evaluation, please? And I ask you to also fill out our evaluation form because it helps us to know what to do, what pace to go, what you want to learn, that kind of stuff. So please fill this out and we will leave it uh, posted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we will leave it posted for you to fill it out, even if you leave off of the off of the um, think of thought. Any last remarks? Any last questions? Again, let me thank Luca for bringing us all the way through these tutorial thinkathons, and thank Ken for his um, great presentation today. That takes a lot of work to put together two and a half hours of content. So um, thank you very much, Ken.